You're listening to the Weekly Darts Cast, and now your co-hosts. One time, UK Open, Riley's qualifier participant Alex Moss, and the one time VIP guest of Barry Hearn, Burton DeWitt. 180! Hello and welcome to a new episode of the Weekly Darts Cast, a more regular episode for you guys. Alex Moss here, joined as always by my co-host, darts statistician Burton DeWitt. Burton, how are you doing? I am a little bit bored, but aren't we all healthy and that's really all that matters. How are you, Alex? Yeah, likewise, but uh, good to good to have a catch up with you this week and, and get, a, as I say, a, a more regular episode out. We've got three guests for you coming up. Going to hear from one in, in just a moment's time, the, the PDC chairman, Barry Hearn. We've also got Chris Mason and, and Dave Evans coming on the show, but let's get straight into our first interview. It is with the PDC chairman, Barry Hearn. Joined today by the chairman of Madfoom Sport, Barry Hearn. Barry, how are you? I'm good, good my friend. friend. Good to talk to you. Likewise, and um, we have Alex here as well, and uh, have to start off, um, obviously heard that you were in hospital this week, so want to ask about your health. How are you uh, doing? How's the recovery going? Yeah, listen, it's, uh, it's one of those things you've got to get through. I had a heart attack 18 years ago. This one wasn't as strong, so that's a positive, but I knew what to expect. They did a brilliant job on me with the NHS Sunday night. Had one night in critical care, came out, transferred to another hospital on the Monday. They operate on the Tuesday and Wednesday night I went home. So I'm now I'm under instructions, which I shall not completely ignore, of course, because they know what they're doing. But no gym for four weeks. Gives me plenty of time to sit around, talk to guys like you and plan the future as always. I'm in a state of permanent excitement, and uh, that's how I live my life. So I'm 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 in reasonable shape, uh, and I'm sure I get stronger and stronger as the as the days proceed. Good to hear you're on the mend, and obviously it's a, a weird time for everyone, but a, a lot going on behind the scenes. What's been the hardest part for Matchroom? Venue logistics, calendar logistics, the uncertainty, or, or something else? Yeah, I think the uh, the uncertainty is the the worst part because if you you know no matter how much shit you're in. If you knew a date when you're going to be out of this shit, you can plan accordingly. Mm -hmm. And the big uncertainty is we don't know how long this dreadful virus pandemic is going to last. Uh, Clearly, it's it's going to disrupt our lives for a lot longer than we'd like. Uh, My job with, I have 650 event days this year globally. Um, That's a logistical nightmare in these times. And obviously, I'm also more than aware that most of my people that I care about, apart from my own employees who are 100% safe and will be paid in full however long this goes because that's the type of company we run. But my my big concern is my my players. You know, they're they're self-employed people. They rely on activity to earn their living, to put bread on the table, to pay their mortgages. They've got wives and children. So I'm very desperate for their sake to get things back to normal. But you know, our hands are tied and we have to be seen to be responsible, mature. And therefore, we have to follow government guidelines. There's no shortcuts to this. So the worst thing is the uncertainty in an hour long. Um, but it doesn't stop you trying to be creative in the background to try to stimulate activity so that people can feed their children. So, well, I mean... As you mentioned, the uncertainty is a big thing, and we'll start by talking darts. We know that everything's off until June at the earliest, possibly July, if not later. Um, And you mentioned you have to care about the players, and considering that it's now in darts a near global uh, playing contingent, under what conditions do you expect you'll be right to start the season back up? Uh, Well, at the moment, I mean, we're, I've spent the last few weeks planning, looking at what's possible what's not possible this is going to go on i think you know we know for the next three or four weeks it's going to be i think an extension of the lockdown i believe before there's any chance of anything happening um we are looking at three or four stages one is behind closed doors uh in as far as in your own house second stage is behind closed doors in as far as tournaments without crowd and the third may be limited crowds, but standard tournaments before we go on to 
the utopia of four, which is back to normal. Um, estimates of how long that's going to take um, vary. We're seeing slowdowns in Spain, Italy. We're, we're beginning to see, I think in a week's time or so, we should see a beginning of a slowdown in the UK. But uh, don't forget, we're a global sport now, you know, so it's not a question of, okay, we can have players' championships games behind closed doors because we can't if our membership can't travel to play. It wouldn't be fair. So that's a big issue in terms of rankings, in terms of what's going to happen with Q School next year. There's there's a thousand things which we can't make a decision on yet and we've got to wait and see. The four <laughs> phases of recovery that we're working on. I don't think we've covered that. Um, phase one is going to be an expansion of our in-house entertainment, if you like. Phase two will be behind closed doors um, tournament. Phase three will be military crowd events. And phase four is back back to normal. Next week, we'll announce a major move on behind closed not behind closed doors, in your own house development. We have a a brilliant team of administrators that have been working on a master plan to involve the entire tour on a real extravaganza of darts. It will lack the atmosphere of a crowd, of course, and it will be not at the production level that we're used to, but it will give us a regular supply. And as I say, I've got to tease you on that because the announcement on that will be early next week. So watch this space and get ready to see a lot of darts. That's good to hear. And just touching on the, the TV events, your colleague Matt Porter has done a, a few interviews in the last few weeks with regards to about the, the Premier League. It, it wouldn't really work behind closed doors without a crowd, but could we potentially see other TV events go on behind closed doors? Yeah, we can't We can't say no to anything for sure, because the most important thing is the players and they have to earn money and they earn money when we stage events. Now, the crowd is just a question of they're brilliant for the atmosphere, of course, but um, it, they contribute significantly to the finances of an event. But the PDC is a major company, and given the choice of no event or an event without a crowd, we would generally opt for an event without a crowd to maintain the earning power of our players. Um, the next big event clearly is the World Cup at, scheduled at the end of June and the World Match Play in July. And we're, and we're literally reviewing this on a daily basis of is it going to happen? Can it happen? What's the circumstances to make it happen? We're not cancelling anything. So the message to the players and the darts fans is, look, now we're all in this mess together. Um, we're not cancelling. When I say we're not cancelling, we are going to cancel things like World Series in New York, as you know, because that's not, that's not going to happen. And we're going to cancel Australia in August. But everything else, we are postponing. And... It just means that when we get back to normal, we're going to be really busy and the players will be catching up on their earning potential. That's the plan. Well, we're going to ask you about uh, both those things. And you mentioned the World Series. You mentioned postponing events. Let's start with the World Series. Uh, New York and uh, Australia and New Zealand events kicked to 2021. How big of a blow is that to the PDC considering... Um, the emphasis the PDC is placing on the World Series to grow the game globally. Well, the World Series has been fantastically successful for us in exactly achieving that. And the broadcasters it's brought in for our other events has been significant. But, you know, this is the world we're operating in and we have to be realistic. If at the end of the day we have to go on ice for a period of time with the World Series, in this case a year, um, we've rescheduled the Copenhagen event for October but the other events will be uh, cancelled for this year. And so what does it affect? It affects PDC profitability and a limited number of players won't earn the money they would have earned in World Series. In, in what's going on in the world, that's a small price to pay. But obviously we want to limit the number of events that, that come into that category, which we're endeavouring to do, as you've seen on Premier League and European Tour events and Pro Tour events. We will move heaven and earth to catch those events up by the end of the year. So whereas the players, the fans, the PDC have a short-term problem, we're determined that it doesn't become a long-term problem. You touched on it there, really. Fixture congestion is almost inevitable, really. But is is there a chance that 
um, some of the, the bigger events in the autumn get postponed and pushed back, including the, the World Championship, in order to complete the season, or, or some of those might get cancelled? No, if, uh, if we're allowed to play, we will play. And if that means we're playing seven days a week to catch up, we'll play seven days a week. If there was eight days, we'd play eight days. So our big concern for me is that everybody gets their opportunity because we've created a field of dreams with darts for darts players. We're not going to change our focus. We're helping the PDPA, obviously. They've made a, a contribution to everyone's expenses initially on a non-refundable grant. And we're creating a, a substantial benevolent fund so that people, pro tour card holders who are important to us that come under hard times will get financial assistance by advances. Um, but the main concern is these guys want to play darts. So we've got to create opportunity, whether it's in their own homes or whether it's behind closed doors or whether it's normal events. If we have to have a sabbatical for a few weeks, which looks like we are, we will be postponing, not cancelling the vast majority of the events we do. And then we'll be playing catch up for the rest of the year. And if I hear one player say, oh, I'm too busy, I'll kill him. <laughs> so, it, you know, it's gonna, we're, we're in where we are. But the most important thing, what I want to get to is when we come round, hopefully in a healthy world, to the World Championships in December, we look back over the year, we examine the character we've shown, the resilience we've shown, and we say, do you know what? That was a tough few months for everybody. But we're back where we were. We've caught up on everything. We've fulfilled our obligations to players, to sponsors, to broadcasters. And now we're ready to get back to normal. The game's in a very healthy state. The PDC, as a company, is run, if I say it myself, extremely well. We have cash reserves. We are not the type of people that take the money and run. We save up for a rainy day and suddenly we find ourselves where the weather is pouring, not raining. But we are in a position far stronger than most sports in as far as we haven't spent our money. We've got reserves, we've got resources and we can get through this troubled time. And when we do, we will come out, as always, stronger than we went in. Well... You mentioned better than some other uh, sports and some other organizations. We'll get to one of those eventually, but let's talk about some of your other um, sports in your portfolio. World snooker season was nearly complete yep. when everything had to go on pause and the world championships now being, it looks like it's going to be arranged for late summer. Um, do you think that might mean there might have to be an abbreviated season next year or has those plans not even been thought about? Well, I okay. mean, we think about it all the time because we look on plans A, B, C, and D, and, and there are four, always four ways of, of, of looking to see what's going to develop. The biggest problem, I think, for all sports at the moment, especially global sports like darts and, and snooker, is the fact that the travel restrictions don't make it a level playing field for everybody. Because clearly, if someone can't get out of their country, how the hell can they compete in a ranking system that is played in the majority of it in Europe. So we've got to wait and see how other countries develop as well. You know, you've, you've enough experience of America, which is obviously a huge pandemic there and, and growing. We don't know how long it's going to be before people will want to fly to America or vice versa, Americans fly to Europe. So we've got to just make sure that we've got our plans in place. On the snooker side, um, I think, We've allocated the dates previously reserved for the Olympics. And really, it's a fingers crossed job, you know. And we are gambling that by the end of July, early August, we can stage the World Snooker Championships at the Crucible in Sheffield, or we can stage it without a crowd. One of those is more than likely to be an option, but circumstances will tell us and the government will advise us what is safe and healthy to do. We're not going to take a risk with the health or safety of our officials, our staff or our players. But clearly, the world has got to, at some stage, get back to normality. We just got to make sure that we're in a position to be there, to be ready. But we're in, geared up now to create events within a three or four day platform because the infrastructure is in place. It's just a question of when that green light shines. We can't really give a definitive answer more than that in today's circumstances. 
back to the darts. The, the rumours are that the BDO are set to lose their spots in the Grand Slam this year. Even if that's not the case yet, everyone's aware of their financial issues at the moment. What do you think should happen to those eight spots if the BDO is no more? I think they should. The Grand Slam is a unique event. It features amateur players as well as professional players. I think that principle should maintain itself. The question of selection will very much depend on, as I say, I have no idea what's happening with the BDO. We've had discussions with the WDF about what they're going to do. But, you know, with with all the problems of the BDO, WDF, the lack of finance that both of them have to, to carry out their roles effectively, when you add the coronavirus to it, goodness me, you know, it's, it, it becomes almost an unsolvable, unsolvable mystery. If we assume that by the time we come around to late October, November, when the Grand Slam's on, that we are allowed to do an event, then we would still use every effort through whatever selection process seems appropriate to select the number of amateur players to maintain the unique format of the Grand Slam. So... You mentioned that unique aspect of the Grand Slam. You also mentioned the WDF there. So um, I'm audibling a bit because you kind of answered a few of our questions that we were planning to ask before we asked them. Um, what do you could you see the WDF taking over the amateur game? Um, or what well, the, the big problem you've got is let's be realistic. None of them have got any money. They haven't got. Working capital, and this is what I said earlier about the strength of the PDC, is from day one we've run a proper business, a profitable business, a sustainable business. Yes, we've done amazing things with the prize money, of course, because it's gone from, in my time, from £500,000 a year to, what, £16 million, which is great. But we could have gone bigger, but we didn't because we ran a proper, sustainable business. So we can finance disasters like the coronavirus. When you look at the BDO, I'm not going to criticise the BDO. They are what they are. And I'm not going to criticise the WDF. Their heart's in the right place. But they don't have any money because they haven't run a business that has put aside and run it properly so that, you know, they've got a sustainable operation. So I have no idea. All I know is that we are there to help, and that is a genuine offer, subject to them showing us that they can run a proper business. And, you know, once this epidemic is passing, there is going to be a backlog of not just my sports. I'm involved in 12 different sports now, but there's a hundred sports out there. There's going to be a backlog of events. There's going to be an awful lot of competition for sponsors, for broadcast hours. We have long-term deals in place with most major broadcasters globally we will have a certain amount of protection because of our size and reputation. Unfortunately, the BDO don't, and the WDF has no commercial expertise at all. Now, that's not being cruel. That's just being accurate, which is why we've said to the WDF, in principle, we can, we'd like to help. We think a, a, a strong grassroots business globally is important to our success in the long term. It certainly spreads the gospel of darts, and we'd like to help. But I've yet to see a plan put in front of me that is workable. We've received many listener questions. We'll finish up with a, a few of those. Earlier in the year, a potential shootout was spoken about by players, pundits and fans. Is there potential for such a tournament to be held by the PDC, similar to the snooker version? Not in the short term, no. Because for the next 12 months, it's going to be massive catch-up. Uh, new ideas are going to be built around more social media digital applications, perhaps more creative ideas like we're going to announce next week. But I think a, a new idea, which isn't a new idea, which is a shootout version, is not high on our agenda at the moment. Now, two years into the expanded Alley Pally field, and it seems to be working well. What are your thoughts on it? And is the plan to keep it at the current 96 person uh, size? Yeah, yeah. I think uh, when when something's not broken, I don't try and fix it. Uh, I think we've we've moved carefully with the field and the selection process. Well, you never you never can say there won't be a few more tweaks to it. You know whether where they should be looking at perhaps more women, 
perhaps more countries. Uh, there could be a few small tweaks, but nothing significant because the event is now established as one of the true global phenomenons of sport. It's, it is what Christmas is all about. The prize money is decent and won't be going up for another year or so, but I don't see why it doesn't eventually climb up to double what now. Um, but they are long-term plans and we're in a short-term world at the moment. So for the moment, I'm very happy with the World Championships. I just want to know that the event can safely be staged and then all systems go and we'll have another bonanza. Now, we've asked you this next one before, but with the success of Fallon Sherrick and Lisa Ashton, we've been sent in a few times. Is it time to start a ladies' tour of, say, 16 or 32 players? Linda Duffy, the ex-ladies world number one, sent that in and said that she'd be keen to help out. Not really, no. Again, I mean, all plans of anything new are on on the shelf. You know, we're in a, a different world and we've got to cope with this new world before we start looking at anything new. It is a statement of fact that last year's entries from women in the World Championship qualifier was down on the year before. That doesn't encourage me. We asked a lot of the women who entered two years ago, why didn't you enter this year? They said, because we didn't think we had a good, we didn't think we had a chance. That's not a good thing. Now, do you do a very mini version or is that more likely something that should be on the radar of the amateur bodies, properly organized, properly financed? I feel that's a job more for them. Our attitude at the PDC has always been a gender free sport and we will maintain that. There are no barriers to entry whatsoever. It's only built on ability, but we're not geared up with the structure we have concentrating on challenge tour, developmental tours and main tour, we're not geared up for a just a notional a PC friendly 16 player little get together type of event. It doesn't fit in the professional mode of what we're trying to do. And the challenge really is out to the women themselves to make the effort to improve and to be competitive against men because there is no reason why they shouldn't be we're not going to start saying we're going to do a tournament for left-handed people or a tournament for men who part their hair on the right instead of the left. <laughs> you know, we're basically saying this is a game of darts. Play it to the highest standard you can. Uh, I don't make excuses. If you're not good enough, you can still enjoy the game socially, but it doesn't make you a professional player. So I think the challenge is there more for the BDO, should they exist, and the WDF, should they want to be involved? Again, we're always there to help, but we are realistic. In, in life, you have to do what you're good at. We are very, very, very good at what we do. We, we don't, don't want to take on things where we're not very good at what we do, but we're quite happy to help financially for the greater good of the game. Well, if you ever do start a uh, tournament for left-handed people who part their hair on the right, let me know because I might have a chance to qualify. Uh, but uh, I understand the level you play at is probably your only chance. <laughs> so, <laughs> well, one more question, and you mentioned you only do things that you know you're good at, and this question comes from our producer Hannah. If you could take over any other sport to promote and push it to the wider world, uh, which one would you pick? There's a choice. There are so many sports. As I get older, Burton, and probably as you do get older and maybe health also brings this realism in, you become quite retrospective in your attitude. You know, you look at things in a slightly different way. The more I look at professional sport, other than a few notable examples, it's true, but certainly what I would call the niche sport world, they are all pretty poorly administered and pretty poorly commercially exploited. That is a statement of fact. And there are lots of sports that have in the past been considered quite big sports that have failed in applying themselves, in being relevant in a changing market, in not being creative in their structural or financial roles. Uh, so it's not a question of one. There are dozens of sports that, frankly, are failing the participants by not being good enough. 
sport generally, especially niche sports, where there isn't the money in at the beginning, generally the people that run those sports absolutely love that sport. You cannot fault their enthusiasm or their commitment. But it doesn't mean to say they're any good. It just means they're lovely people. So you may like gymnastics. You may like rugby league. You may like Scottish football. You may like gymnastics. If the player is not changing his life financially by sacrificing his life to achieve the standard necessary, in my view, you have failed. So looking back, there are a dozen which would ring off my tongue of sports that have been big in the past, but have not matured in today's changing world. They have not adapted to their target audience. And they've, and they've not, not listened. listened. They've not listened to the requirements of broadcasters and fans and sponsors. You know, sport is about money. Making money. There's not Corinthian standards. If we're asking people to dedicate their life, we have a responsibility to reward them for the extraordinary ability they have. A lot of sports don't have that, but they still love their sport. The Olympics is always a great example because everyone loves the Olympics, but you can't eat a medal. You've got to think about reward and that's where they mostly go wrong and you know we've seen it with the bdo darts if you want to take that as an example i'm sure that the people involved in the bdo over the years love their darts they've just not been very good at it commercial exploitation and that's an integral part of making a sport successful so with that type of attitude there's 10 or 20 sports out there that could benefit from a rethink of the way they operate and whether they do or not, or whether they think sport is bigger than money, which is a nice sentiment to have, it's just totally inaccurate in today's world. Well, Barry, thank you so much for joining us, and we wish you uh, the best on your recovery, and we hope to see some uh, sport uh, in the very near future. I think, I think you're going to see it quite quickly. quickly. So I look forward to that in the next couple of days. Matt Fulton and his team will come out with various announcements that will at least, I hope, in these difficult times, put a smile on your face. Big thank you to Barry for his time. And it's been a month now into this break without proper darts, if you like. We've seen a few other things going on uh, away from the, the PDC. But how have you found the, the break so far? I, You know, I think it came at a good time for me because... I, I feel like I needed a break. This is obviously not the situation that I wanted a break from darts uh, in or under. Um, and it's this is a tragic time period. And we've seen it already affect darts with Kyle Anderson um, testing positive. It seems to be that he's in recovery and we hope that he does. And we wish him a very speedy and complete recovery. Uh, but just personally, I think it was good for me to be able to have a break. But it's not... You know, it's not good for the players. And you heard it from Barry. I mean, for many of these players, this is their livelihood. And even for those that have full or part-time jobs as well, they might not be having full or part-time jobs right now as the entire world shuts down. Um, so it's it's a, also frustrating for that reason. Um, and plus, sports make a very good distraction. And you don't realize how much you miss it until you miss it. Uh, happens, you know, whatever your favorite sport is, unless it starts because it really is no off season. But if you do follow any team sport where there is an off season, you start to feel it in the off season. For me, you know, when January and February rolls around, it's about then March, and there's no American football. I feel I feel a little bit bored at times, and I guess it's. This, you know, same for other sports as well. Um, and we've just had to go through now a month without it while also having to worry about our health and our family's health and our jobs. And for many of us, it's not been a good time period at all. Um, and I hope for all of our listeners that you've been untouched by this. But if you have, you do have our sympathies. And we hope that that you get through this 
as best as you can. So it's a break that just is a break from everything. And I think that makes it a little bit more uh, just tough to deal with. Uh, but I, I, it's now I am getting bored. I think everyone's getting bored. And we're ready for darts to come back, even if darts is not yet ready to fully come back. We'll hire this week. Hopefully there'll be something. It seems like there will be things. Um, so the break might just be a break from official in-person competition, but it's, it is, it is starting to be draining. Yeah. We just heard from Barry teased us a, a little bit about an announcement that's going to come out this week when, when you're listening could already be out by the time you're listening to this. We're not quite sure when it's coming out, but PDC are, are putting plans in motion to bring us Darts that we've something like that we've never seen before with, with with no crowds and the players playing in in their own houses. We're not quite sure what it's going to look like, but that's that's coming out. But yeah, I mean, first and foremost, our thoughts are with everyone that's been affected by the the coronavirus, and of course, Kyle Anderson. You mentioned they tested positive back home in, in Australia. We wish him all the best as well. But it's 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 not. It's been nice to see darts maybe the community rallying together a little bit, and one of the guest that we got on this week Chris Mason's done a, a brilliant job raising over £10,000 for, for the NHS here in the UK and uh, raffling different prizes from various different players and people that have sent him stuff he, he mentioned a, a long list and there was probably people that he might have left off on there but other people Michael Smith I think has been playing people they've just got to donate a little bit of money to to a charity Ram Van Barneveld Phil Taylor they've had a game on on, on YouTube in the, in the past week raising money for charity as well and uh, it's been it's been good to see. And in terms of ourselves, we've not been able to produce our regular show. And if you maybe go back ten years, that the calendar wasn't as busy as it is going into 2020. We we basically bring in a show every week because there's been that much to talk about. But we've been trying our best to to do different things like the the Darts Legend series that we've started up. Matthew Keenan, the Darting Nerd, he's bringing us some content that we're going to be rolling out next week the Riley's lockdown challenge when he's trying to play as many people as he can that have been Riley's qualifiers that's um I've had a little listen to that before we started and that's going to be good stuff but yeah it's just just challenging for everyone we, we just hope that we can return as soon as it's, it's safe to do so and uh we've got a, a busy end to the the season uh one thing that will return or hopefully will return as soon as it's safe to do so is the Premier League um, April and May dates have been postponed of course talking Premier League darts obviously all well for Premier League football um, the next Premier League darts now scheduled for uh, 30th of July in Birmingham uh, what do you make of the now extended Premier League season that's going to go all the way into October I think this is what we expected and when we spoke on our last show a, a few weeks ago now we were talking about how important is it for the PDC to keep the Premier League going, keep the season at some point in the calendar. And we both said that it's a big money spinner for the PDC and the crowds that they get for the Premier League, of course, is shown on, on Sky Sports all around the world. But how many people are turning up to these events and the prize money that's on offer, it was um, it was right up there in terms of importance for them to make sure that they could get dates. And looking at the calendar now, all the, the rescheduled dates, really, as you, as you said there, the, the next one's not until the 30th of July, which seems like a long time away Glenn Durrant's going to lead the Premier League for a long time without um, playing but looking at what they've done I think they've done a as good a job as they could really they they couldn't really push it into June I think that would still be a little bit early and maybe July is, is a little bit early so they've pushed it right until the end of July but looking at the, the calendar now that the rescheduled one I think it's nice that they've been able to keep it on that formula of having it on the first day obviously they've got the double header in Rotterdam which is Wednesday Thursday but keeping it on that Thursday time slot, which everyone's used to. But I think also what's been a good part of it as well is, for the most part, you've got it week after week. You've got it on that that regular format, if you like, where it's Premier League Thursday after Thursday after Thursday. I think there's only two uh, times now in the calendar where there's a a two-week break, and that's July the 30th, the first one back, and then Belfast the 13th of August, there's that fortnight break. And then uh, Newcastle October 1st to October 15th, the finals night now in Sheffield where they've got a two-week break. So from that respect, it's good. And um, yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll see what's going to happen now with the Premier League. It's a, a long time now, but hopefully we'll see some darts before that, that July the 30th. And by the sounds of it with Barry Hearn, the players are going to be busy now um, playing darts at home. Yeah, and uh, I, I, I'm in agreement there. And I think the one event the Premier League, well, other than um, the World Championships that the PDC could not afford 
to lose is the Premier League because of how much of a cash cow it really is. And it brings in money not just to the PDC, but also to the PDPA to stage the Pro Tour. And having the extended season, besides the fact that it allows Glenn Durant to set a record for most days on top of a table in one Premier League campaign, because he's going to be on top for at least four and a half months and no campaign's ever even been that long. So congrats to Durant for setting a PDC record. But beyond that, um, it does increase the chance that we'll be able to have these events and not just have these events, but have them with some crowd there. I, I, it's going to be tough to imagine that we're going to be able to have full crowds anytime before the autumn anywhere. And it's it seems a bit weird and how you're going to have to decide who gets to keep their tickets and who will have to get reimbursed to be able to use them next year is going to be a logistical nightmare in and of itself. But at least there's now a chance by having this calendar route that we might be able to have a decent-sized crowd there and maybe even by the end of the season be able to have full crowds for the playoffs. It's also going to be good that we're going to get to see the playoffs try a new venue. Um, the O2, of course, is a great venue for it, not just because of its size, not just because of its centrality, but also its iconic uh, stature as one of, if not the big arena in Britain, right up there with any others. Um, now it's going to go to Sheffield, and maybe this will lead to it moving around, seeing other places not just get to say, you can host Premier League, but you can host the final, and eventually maybe even see the final even next year or the following year, go to the Netherlands or Germany to have the playoffs somewhere else. I think this is a good uh, testing site for that, to see how it works somewhere else. Um, and I could see that start to be something that moves around. Um, maybe even in the future, if this works out, have the uh, Premier League finals move to August and have it in Australia one year. Wouldn't that be something? Um, definitely something that could be on the radar if this works out. Um, so I think having the extended schedule, it was necessary, but it also gives them a chance to experiment, um, even if it's just in little ways like that, uh, that might have a long-term impact on the sport. Let's hear from our next guest then, and it is with the ITV pundit and commentator, Chris Mason. I'm pleased to say I'm joined by the ITV pundit and commentator, Chris Mason. Chris, thanks for the time. How are you doing? Yeah, I'm good, mate. Absolute pleasure as always. Now, firstly, uh, how are you getting on and how are you finding that the lockdown we find ourselves here in the UK, like many other countries around the world at the moment? Yeah, a little bit tough. Um, as most of the listeners, listeners will know, I, <laughs> I enjoy my gym and, and working out and, and just generally generally the outdoors, enjoy me fishing and, and stuff like that. So, yeah, it's been a bit tough, but it's, it's just tough for everybody. And we've just got to take the, the advice of, uh, of those that, uh, no better than we do, you know, the doctors and scientists and all the rest of it. But, uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's been tough. I've, I've managed to uh, borrow a, a, a bike, so the, the hour that we are allowed to go out and exercise, I've been making the most of that, really, and just, you know, going out for the odd run and, and keeping myself as, as busy as I can at home. Yeah, and one of the things you've been doing, we've, we've seen on Twitter, you've been doing an excellent job raising money for the NHS, I think over £10,000 when we're talking right now. Talk us through the idea to put the different raffles on and which players have helped out so far. Yeah, it was just, it just sort of had an idea in my head of, of you, know, the, not, you know, with all the, the coverage that the NHS have got and, and the, the, I mean, most of them on the front line are putting their, their own lives at risk um, for, for us. And, you know, we've heard some tragic stories of, of where frontline staff have, have caught the virus and, and have had to isolate and sometimes isolate away from their own family. And I thought, well, what could I do? And I, and I know sort of darts is, is very popular at the minute and everybody's missing it. But there's a, there's a massive social media following, just not just, you know, for myself, but obviously for the, the sport in general and the followers and, and everybody else was doing their bit. And I started off and I asked a couple of players, look, would you... Would you think about donating a shirt? I'm gonna, I'm gonna try and raffle them. You know, with this bits of technology out there that makes it not simple, but it's still a bit of a, a bit of a pain to, to put together. Obviously, because you've got to get all the names that have donated and then put them into a draw and then do a raffle and film it. And I thought, well, I'll have a go. And it, <clears throat> it, it just sort of it started off. John McDonald said, "Look, I've got a Rob Cross shirt you can have," and I mean he's brilliant for all the charities. And then Bobby George and. Devin Peterson, Daryl Fitton, Bunting, Lisa Ashton, Ian White, 
Glenn Durant, literally, literally um, Desi Price, uh, MDG and Modus, uh, they chipped in, and then Darts Planet offered some VIP packages for, for people to, to, you know, become a member of their site, and it, it just it just went on and on and on, and uh, Paul Wilson then started donating tickets for his shows, the Dazzler in December, and people just sort of got involved, and they were chipping in with fivers and tenors, depending on on the price of the tickets, and I, I, had, I had a mad idea. I thought, right, well, I'm going to try and raise ten grand. I never thought I'd get anywhere near it, but um, yeah, yesterday I put nine shirts up for grabs yesterday. So there was, you know, great opportunities. Ten quid got you a, a, a ticket into every draw. You know, people like John Worsley have sent me, you know, bundles of bits. Bill Barr has sent me a load of signed programs. It's just sort of, it's just snowballed and, and just gone on and on and on. I, I'm bound to. Kevin Painter as well, Gary Plummer from Target, um, John Pierce, and then and then people just general people off of Twitter, um, you know, donating stuff that, that that they've had themselves. It's just been it's just been mad. It's funny. Some bands have left loads of people out as well because Murph Kingy also putting a shirt. Diego Portella, Jeff Smith from Canada, Jamie Caven. These are they all they've all they've, they've all chipped in chipped in with something uh, so much so I've, I've just just gone over my 10 grand target and, I, and I've still got a, a few bits left so my, my plan is now that the, the fund set up uh, for the frontline staff the money's gone off to them um, and apparently when things all settle down I'm going to go with their, uh, they're basically going to put on a dinner for all those that donated and, and you're going to get a little presentation I mean I'm, although it sounds a lot of money it's minuscule up to the amount of money some have raised um, and then the rest of it uh, Michael Smith came up with the idea. He, Michael Smith is another one. He was straight in with a with a great donation, but he came up with a fab idea. He he's raised I think over seven thousand, and he's he's gonna he's been going to the supermarket and anybody else anybody wearing their NHS lanyard, he's been um, paying for their groceries. So anything over the top of the ten grand, that's what I'm going to do in my in my local supermarket. So I'm going to spend a day in the local supermarket. I'm going to spend a few days depending on how much how much money I have. And um, I'm just going to pay for their groceries. I think that's just a nice, a nice touch for those that are that, that are working on the front line at the moment. Absolutely, yeah. It's been been really nice to see doing a, a great job. And when we last had you on, I, I believe it was just after the the PDC World Championship. We'll come on to the the PDC later. But we we also touched a little bit on the BDO, and you announced that you weren't going to be part of the TV team for the upcoming World Championship at the O2. But did you get to watch much of it? And what was your impression on how the event went? Um, yeah, I think it was a, a wise move in the end. <laughs> um, I think they've done it. I know. You listen, you can't uh, you can't hide from the fact that the, the darts was, was all forms of darts is great. You know, it, we're seeing the PDC have been doing darts online, and Modus now are doing their live league and their icons of darts uh, live league and stuff like that. And it's it just shows you the the hunger for the sport. So yeah, I watched the majority of it. I was a, a uh, it's fabulous to see Wayne Warren. It was uh, ironic when you think of the the com- combined age of the two new champions was sort of over a hundred. It was incredible, really. Peter Wright, first time winner at forty nine, and then Wayne Warren. And uh, you know, my my underlying uh, underlying feeling was just just sorrow for him. I mean, a great achievement. But when you win a when you win a world title in your chosen sport, it should you know it should be life changing. And he ended up with a with a paltry. 22,000 I think it was in the end and I think Dean Wynn Stanley was doing a fundraiser for the for the women's prize money well sport at, sport at any level shouldn't be like that and he, he knew you know he knew at the time uh, there's Jacqueline that the funds weren't going to be there it was a disastrous move ultimately without the funding in place taking it to the O2 I mean the O2 don't get me wrong it's a, it's a wonderful venue for darts I mean I've I played there for uh, show nights for Wayne Dobinson, who I know had a uh, had a massive part in trying to promote the event himself. But yeah, I just I just felt sorry for the players. You know, they they spend all that money traveling the circuit for the whole year for that you know that golden egg at the end to to to, to try and become world champion and and, and get life changing money where they could maybe then go on and think about turning pro and giving the PDC a circuit where you know poor Wayne Warren. You know, by the time he t- took his expenses out for the year and tax and everything else, 
there ain't going to be a lot left in the pot for him to do anything with. So uh, I enjoyed the darts. Uh, I thought it was. I thought from sort of the last sixteen onwards for the men, and then the, the sort of the last eight onwards for the ladies. I thought it was. I thought it was a great event. Yeah, and you touched on there that the prize fund being slashed and behind the scenes uh, a lot of uncertainty really with regards to the BDO and a few months after that event more recently we've seen that the chairman Des Jacklin resign. Looking back now do you feel that the decision to, to move to the O2 and the prize fund being slashed was the, the final blow really for his reign in charge? Yeah absolutely I, I, you know it's, it's, he's a decent enough fella and he obviously has a, a huge passion for the game which we've seen in previous years with people that have that are involved in the BDO, the vast majority of them, you know, they they basically do it for the love, uh, which is all very well and good. But unfortunately, in in modern day sport, you need industry experts, and I know it's a word I've I've, I've overused in the in the last sort of five years. But it just won't. It will never be anything than what it is uh, until they change what's gone wrong. You know, if it's not broke and everything else, you don't try. But it's been broke for you know, nigh on 30 years. And, and the same thing keeps going, happening over and over again. You've got people doing deals with other people that if you had half an understanding of the industry, you never would have done. And that put them in, in absolutely financial turmoil over the last few years. But And they can't be helped. They don't listen to people that know. The Olive Branch has been out there by the PDC for, for many years. I know Barry and, and Matt Porter have always said, look, we're, we're here to help. There's, you know, the BDO is, the PDC is not in competition with the BDO. Let, let, let's have that right. Um, which is why that, that olive branch has been there by the, uh, the PDC. So much so that, you know, maybe a moment of madness, Barry, even at one stage, offered to, offered to rescue it and buy it. Um, he must look back at that now. But the thing is, people say that he must look back and think he was mad, but ultimately those things wouldn't have happened uh, if he was at the helm. Um, but yeah, there's, there's just, listen, he might be a property developer and a former nightclub owner. That doesn't have any correlation whatsoever to uh, signing TV deals and, and trying to secure sponsorship deals and negotiating a uh, contract. It just, you know, there's, there's just, it, it just one doesn't transfer into the other. And ultimately, he had to go. Uh, I, didn't, I didn't think anybody could do any more damage, but... Uh, somehow in just over 12 months, you know, he lost lost the longest running deal with, with Wimmel, uh, with the World Masters, and the World Masters was an absolute disaster and ruined everything at Lakeside. I'm not saying Lakeside is perfect, but until you've got something in place where prize money is guaranteed and all his faults, Bob Potter, every, every year that they were in trouble, he bailed them out financially. Until you've got something better in place, it's better the dog you know. And uh, again, that was that that was just a lack lack of experience on on Des Jacklin's part. But hopefully now things are going to improve. I know that the the WDF are are attempting uh, to to take over, especially the, the the major events side of things. So fingers crossed for the players, because the, as we've always said, the BDO has a place in darts. The, Every, every sport needs a, an amateur organisation, and that's not a slight. It, it is what it is. They're the amateur governing body of darts, and, and that should be embraced. Uh, they should run with that ethos. There's loads of amateur organisations that are financially stable all over the world, and there's no reason why they can't, with the, with the right people running it, uh, be exactly that. Definitely, yeah. and back to the, the PDC, the, the last big event that we saw before the, the virus outbreak was the UK Open. You were there for ITV and what a great tournament it was. What were the standout moments for, for you working on the broadcast that weekend? Oh, just just so many. I mean, it's just it's just such a fabulous event. We, you know, we got, we got the multi-boards. We had the big, biggest field ever. I think it was 159 in the end because somebody, I can't remember who it was, pulled out Max Hock maybe, pulled out with, a, with illness. And it was just, it, it was just a, a remarkable event from start to finish. We had, of course, we had nine darter. We, you know, everything was there. Every, um, every I was dotted and, and every T was crossed. And it, it, it never fails to, it never fails to produce that event. I think it always, it always has a story and, you know, you sometimes get a new winner. I mean, on the back of the world, it was, 
you know, it was great. Obviously, Peter Wright winning it. And then what a what a statement of intent for the rest of the year, going and then winning the Masters. And, yeah, it's just, it, it, I just love that tournament. I just think it's, I love the venue. The crowd absolutely love it. It's just a different kind of atmosphere. Uh, and it always will be. And uh, long may that one continue. But it's going to be, it's going to be tough for the BD, BDC now for the remainder of this year when we eventually get the action back because uh, the dark players, I hope they've been getting themselves fit because they're going to be in for a torrid time. If they thought the schedule was tough before, um, the next uh, six or seven months, it's going to be rammed because they're going to have to play, they're going to have to be playing midweek. Definitely, yeah, it's going to be a, a busy time and I suppose before this break that we've had, there was a, a lot of debate of who's the best player in the world. A few people saying Van Gerwen, a few people saying Gerwen Price, a few people saying Peter Wright, a few others coming into the, the four as well. But we saw with the UK Open finished off with another final between Van Gerwen and Price. Van Gerwen coming out on top, but we saw Gerwen Price had a, a decent lead at one point before the doubles let him down and they've played each other in the Premier League a, a little while after that. It's... Um, it does feel like a, a big rivalry developing, but do you need to see Gerwin Price maybe win a few more games against Michael before you can call it that? Yeah, I think he will. I think he will kick himself. I think that was, I think that was more one that he lost rather than it was one that MDG won. Uh, if you understand what I'm trying yeah. to say, he will. He had, he had opportunities and it, it just didn't happen for him. But let, let's not forget, you know, he's still learning his trade. He's come from a completely different sport. He's only been sort of full-time pro probably four or five years and he's you know he's making he's making incredible progress uh and for a guy that you know sort of wasn't born into the game and it and it wasn't something that he did from from day dot uh he, i mean you can't give him enough credit i mean i re, you know i rate him highly i think he's box office i think the game you know it, the game needed him we we needed we needed a new star and it is a rivalry his record like majority, a bit like most people's records against Phil. It's not the best, um, but um, that's here and there at the moment. You know, it's he, he's getting closer. I don't think Michael's as good as he was, uh, and I don't think he has been. I think we see flashes of it. I think I think we've seen flashes of it during the UK. I mean, he, he hit some big numbers, and he threw some lovely darts, but... Um, I think the gap has closed. I think people have got a little bit better, and I think he's regressed slightly not 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 massively, but enough to to make it competitive. If you understand what I'm saying, uh, and that's a that's a great thing. Yeah, I think that's a, a fair assessment. And the, the other big event we've we've seen so far this season, still a, a little way to go on it, is is the Premier League and Glenn Durrant top of the pile, Nathan Aspinall, <laughs> the other uh, Davies Hunt, who's also started very well, beating Van Gogh in one night as well. But it looked on course for a, a really competitive year going um, going well before we had the break. What have you made of the, the start of the Premier League season? Yeah, I loved it. I went to the very last one. Um, I went to the uh, Liverpool Premier League and it, it was great. I literally went there as a punter. We took a couple of uh, a couple of Dark Sky TV winners uh, to the to the night. They had a, a, a night out. We took care of their hotel and we gave them a VIP experience. And it was it was honestly, I absolutely loved it. It was great to go there just as a punter. Um, and yeah, I agree. Nathan Aspinall for me is right up there with you know Michael Smith and. Um, uh, Gerwin Price, they're they're really exciting prospects. They're they're the ones in in four or five years that very very well maybe competing for uh, world honours and and being maybe maybe getting to the top of the rankings. We just don't know, but yeah, I would, I'm gutted because the Premier League was boiling up to be a bit special. Uh, Glenn Durrant again himself been in, been an absolute breath of fresh air, uh, throwing throwing lovely darts. Uh, and he'll, he'll be gutted himself because he, he was looking good uh, for this season. But, you know, they've had this opportunity. If there's been a few little bad habits crept into their game, my God, what an opportunity now to, to go away and, and put them things right. And it is a great opportunity for them to do that. So I, I think a few of them may be a little bit, bit rusty when we do get back. Uh, but I think we'll see some spectacular darts throughout the, the remainder of the year when we do get back properly. 
Two more questions for you, and one more on the the Premier League. The, the fixtures has been a, a lot of change as you've, as you've seen. The, the next one now, not until the end of July. The finals are going to be in Sheffield in in October. Now, obviously, a, a massive money spinner for the PDC, the Premier League. How important was it for them to to keep the season on the calendar? Yeah, I mean, I don't know how they do it. Matt Porter must have had some seriously sleepless nights, uh, as with you know people like Dave Allen and Barry and, and all the, the huge team in, involved in it all. Uh, and it's, you know, it's just out of their control, a lot of these things, and they've just got to, they've just got to do the, the best they can, and the, and the players have just got to try and do the best they can, I suppose. We, we know that the fans will come out in their droves and, and support, because that's what they do. Um, yeah, it must have been just an absolute total headache for them. Uh, but, you know, it's just, it is what it is. Uh, more important things going on around the world with, you know, with, with people losing their lives and that. So I suppose the evidence just got to be put into perspective, and and that that's just one of them things. We just got to just got to wait and see what happens, and and just make the best of a bad job, really. Yeah, definitely. In in terms of the the PDC calendar, we're still waiting to hear about the the next two big events, if you like, the World Cup, the World Match Play, but the the World Series. That's seen the the biggest change so far. That the US event, the free in Australasia, they've all been postponed till next year. The the Denmark one moved to October, and we're not quite sure about the supposed finals, which I think was supposed to be in Austria in September time. But was it the right decision? Do you think to to prioritise that the ranking events, which we're probably expecting to take place during those weekends? Yeah, now? absolutely. I'm still fairly confident that the the World Series finals take place but I'm pretty sure that they'll just effectively rebrand it and maybe maybe call it something else because obviously we've got no no qualification system for it. Uh, it's not going to be impossible um, to put the event on, but it's what they call it and, and how they possibly rebrand it because we don't have all the other ones. It can't be a World Series Finals because... We've not had anything else, so um, I'm not quite sure how they're going to get around that. But you know, they, they know. I mean, they're, they're they're geniuses at their job, which is why the the PDC just continues to go from strength to strength. But um, yeah, I'm I'm sure they'll have it all sussed, and it'll just be it may be just be called just but this year. It may be just be called something else. Well, Chris, it's always a pleasure to have a chat with you. Thank you very much for, for taking the time out and keep up the, the great work that we're, we're seeing you do on Twitter, raising money for the NHS, and hopefully we'll be chatting to you soon when the darts is back up and running. And you guys, you keep uh, keep doing what you're doing. It's uh, great content you've got out there and much needed at the moment where there's not too much going on. So, um, yeah, really appreciate your, your podcast, that's Thanks again to Chris for his time, and let's have a little talk about the, the PDC calendar. The World Series has been the first big casualty of, of the PDC calendar. The US World Series event, the free in Australasia, all postponed to next year. How do you think this will affect the PDC's plan for global domination? Yeah, we heard it a bit from Barry there, and it's in, he's right that this you know these are big events for the sport's growth and also big money maker for the sport. And it is going to hurt the growth. I don't think you've heard of that much in Australia, where there is a very established market already, and the sport, even though it's still small, has a growing audience, and I think losing a year isn't going to affect that. Um, but losing a year in North America, where the sport is making inroads, and it is getting some notice, um, Fallon Sheriff, of course, being a big part of that, but it had, it had already been occasionally making it on to uh, Sports Center, which is our big sports news program here, especially during the World Championships. Um, losing out on this event where you're bringing those players there is big, especially the first year that it was going to be in New York. Uh, that said, they've also lost out on Asia for the last couple of years for a variety of reasons, and maybe that's a place to bring it back next year. And the sport is still growing there without much of a hitch other than the coronavirus hitch that has postponed much of the Asian tour season. But we're seeing the quality of the players playing the Asian tour and the commitment to the players to play the Asian tour now to give Q school a chance to go even without the World Series event. So there has been growth even in places where the World Series isn't going. Um, it will hurt and it is going to put some damper at least on the North American market. But coming back next year and going to New York next year will just 
make up for some of the lost time. I think it's just lost time at the uh, end of it, um, and one year is not going to kill the growth of the sport. That's interesting that you brought up Fallon Sherrick. I didn't actually think about that when I was thinking about this question, but I'm assuming that her place in in the events is going to stay for, for next year. But you, you've got to think that she was involved in all of the, the World Series events that were going to take place during this year. And who knows what, what form she's going to be in going into next year because she would have been coming into it off the back of that World Championship, being that the first female player to beat a, a male player in the PDC World Championship then getting the draw against Glenn Durant in, in the Premier League uh, a few weeks later. Who knows what's going to happen at the end of this year? Is she even going to qualify for the, the PDC World Championship? I know she hasn't got to play Lisa Ashton in the qualifier because she's a, a tour card holder, but there's some quality ladies players that you'd imagine are going to be going into that qualifier thinking, I could do what Fallon Sherrick's done and, and get those big opportunities. So that's maybe a, a thing to think about. I mean, she's got to be one of the players that's thinking right now, this was going to be my year to to really make my mark, maybe make quite a bit of money in the game out of it and and really uh, test herself against the, the world's best. But as I say, I think she's still got the spots for next year. But with regards to the PDC, yeah, I think it's just maybe postponing what their plans really were. And it's a shame, really, because I know we've got listeners in, in Australia and in New Zealand, a few of them that, that get in touch every now and then saying that they enjoy listening to the show and hearing from the different players. And especially when we have players like Damon Hetter and players from Australia and New Zealand that you maybe don't hear often from enough, you know, that they enjoy hearing from them. And for them, these events in, in the summer for us in the UK, is um, that's their big event of the year. They get to go and see the, the top players. So it's a shame for them as well that they're not going to get that chance to see the, the, the big players this year. But in, it's a good way that the PDC have said right off the bat, we're still going to come to you. We'll be back there next year. So, yeah, like you, I think it's just a case of, as you would say, hang tight, we're going to be back next year. <laughs> um, I do have to do a rare correction of something you said. You said she had a draw against Glenn Durant. That should be a draw against Premier League leader Glenn Durant. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, My apologies. Yeah, apology noted. Um, but, yeah, we as we've said a few times, we had Barry Hearn on this week, and he said the plans are still to go forward with the World Cup and World Match play, but obviously there's uncertainty uh, do you think those events are going to go ahead as scheduled or or what? Or what, do you, what do you think for those two big TV events in the middle of the summer? I've, I've got my fingers crossed. I mean, for, for me personally, those two events, two of my favourite events, really, especially the World Match Play. I've been fortunate to go there a few times and it's been my yearly sort of tradition where I've been able to get to the, the Monday night session and, and be there for, for a long weekend. The, the first weekend is, is always good fun. The World Match Play is uh, it's a staple of the darts calendar, isn't it? It's been, I believe, it's the, the longest serving venue in the PDC, potentially in, in darts in terms of TV big events nowadays. Of course, the Lakeside no longer hosting the BDO World Championship. So it, it is an iconic venue, the Winter Gardens, being associated with that tournament. And maybe it could get postponed and pushed further back into the year. So you do have that crowd. It's, it's a difficult one because... A lot of the people there, they do go up there for the weekend or go up there for a few days in the summer. The summer holidays make the most of that. Maybe families, young families, bring their kids to a, to a, to the darts during the, the summer holidays. So it's a tough one, but I'm, I'm not so sure. I, I, I do hope we'll see both of them. I, I know there's different permutations for each one, that the World Cup obviously is in Germany and Hamburg, and you've got to wonder what the situation is going to be like in Germany in, in June, which is obviously a, a little bit more closer than the World Match play. But... It's, um, it's an ever-changing situation and Barry's mentioned that himself. Things are changing every day. Could things be better by then? You've just got to have your fingers crossed. I think we, we know that May, in terms of darts on, on TV and uh, tour events, European tour events, is, is very unlikely. June, that's um, that's the next one that we're a little bit concerned about. Well, match play towards the end of July, when you've got the, the Premier League event that's just been moved there, the 30th, it's... Um, I think it's going to be a little bit touch and go, but yeah, we'll, we'll see. We've got our fingers crossed. Yeah, and one other thing for the World Cup, it's not just, you know, that it's in Germany, it's that you're trying to get 32 different countries together, and even if things have steadied in Germany, it's steadied in Britain, will they have steadied in enough countries that will be competitive to stage the event? You might have a curtailed version, um, or maybe this will be a great opportunity for a TV event that is really played from your home, which could be 
an interesting permutation. Um, although it still would require travel within the country for the people representing to get together to play their pairs match. So I guess they could just do it from their own homes as well, so I guess they don't have to. Um, but maybe that would be the best way for that event to go forward. And it's one that might be able to work and does cut down on the travel costs for the overseas players. Um, but that's the one I think that's most likely to get pushed. I think it might just be a little too soon because of all those intangibles. And when else are you going to put it if you don't put it there? The best option maybe for that would it be move it to the weekend before the week before the world championships because you're going to be having a lot of players come over anyway from other places in the world um and to cut down on costs in a year that i think everyone's going to want to cut down in costs playing that event at the beginning of december the weekend before the world championships might just be the best choice um that said it means they might have to take more time off work but if they're getting a couple thousand pounds to play and possibly more they might um, but I just don't see the World Cup realistically being able to go forward, at least without some change in format, including, as I mentioned, playing it from home. World match, but I think that's more realistic. But again, it might have to be behind closed doors, which will be sad because that's such an iconic venue. And part of it's the venue itself, but part of it is that it is the best crowd in professional darts. It really is a knowledgeable crowd. None of those shenanigans, that, very little of those shenanigans that you see in the Premier League, that you see on the European Tour, that you see at the World Championships. Um, it is a knowledgeable crowd. It is a generally well-behaved crowd, and it's a crowd that is probably the best in the sport. And if it doesn't have that, it loses some of its luster. It might just be for a year, and it might be necessary. But I think that event is very realistic to say that it could go ahead. But again, and we'll get to this once we see what the PDCS announcement is and how it's going to affect things. If there are no events up until then, how are you going to decide the qualification for that? And that's another thing that has to be considered. Um, and we just don't know the answer to that yet. If there's no events until the world match play, that means the field's basically set and we've lost out on a couple dozen events that would have led to players qualifying for that. And that is a bit odd. So I just don't know yet. I think we need to know a little bit more I think the World Cup is much less likely, but the World Match Play, maybe that will go ahead, not just um, sometime, but at its scheduled time. And of course, the, the first ever PDC World Cup 2010 was held in, in early December, round one by the legend himself, Coach Dompey. We'll come on to our final guest on this week's show, and it is with the winner of this uh, last week's, I should say, Modus Icon of Darts event, Dave Evans. I'm pleased to say I'm joined by the winner of this week's Modus Icons of Darts, Dave Evans. Dave, how are you doing? I'm not too bad. How are you? Thank you very much. Doing all right, and thanks very much for the time. And we spoke at the, the World Masters, and you mentioned about your exploits in that tournament at a very young age. But going back before then, how did you first discover darts? Um, it was uh, my father, actually. Um, he got me playing um, when I was about seven or eight years old. Um, he used to run a, a lot of pubs with my mum. And um, the only sports that was obviously while well, living in a pub as a kid was uh, pool and darts, and it was darts that I chose. And it was the 2002 World Masters. Uh, a few days before you had turned 13, you were playing in the men's event at Bridlington Spa. Talk us through, firstly, how you qualified for that event at such a young age. Um, I believe, from what I can remember, it was a, it was a qualifier, um, and I went to. I think it was somewhere in Yorkshire. I, can't, I couldn't believe it. it wasn't Bridlington. It was um, somewhere. I'd say about 20 minutes away from Bridlington. Um, I qualified from there um, and then went and played in the men's. Um, and I didn't realise I was actually playing in the men's qualifiers um, until until the actual day when I got there. Um, so, um, but yeah, it was it was a good experience. A bit, bit nerve wracking at first, but when when you get on the board, it's um, it's really good. Yeah, and you made you made the last 16 that year. What what are your memories of that run? I remember you telling me that you that made you one of the well the youngest players to have played in the men's draw at that time. Yes, yeah, it was. I, I didn't know that until afterwards, um, when somebody had, um, had actually mentioned it. Um, but to be one of the youngest players to play in the World Masters in the men's is, and, and still to this day, is uh, it's a good achievement for me. And um, obviously, to carrying it forward is good. So, in terms of darts after that, what, what did you get up to in the, the years that followed? Did you still play much, or did other things take more of a priority at that time? Yeah, I mean, it was sort of um, a mix between school and um, and darts, really. 
Um, still playing you know, the, odd, the odd few things. I think my first ever county team was when I lived down in um, in Cornwall, um, and that was for Cornwall Youth. Um, and then I moved up back up north and, and played for Lancashire Youth and also um, Cumbria for a year as well. So still uh, still carried on the uh, the darting dreams even while doing through school as well. So. And your first Q school, I, I believe, 2016, and you, you played on the, the Challenge Tour that year as well. What gave you the drive to give the PDC circuit a go? Um, it was actually um, a friend of mine. I was I was just playing local league uh, with him. He was uh, Mick Bushby Junior, um, and he's uh, I don't I'm not sure if he's still playing now. But he he said I'm going playing this PDC um, Challenge Tour. Do you, do you fancy coming? I said, Well, what is it? He said, Well, you pay so much into it, and you could potentially win whatever money, and you play against decent players. So I tried tried that, and that was the first time, first time I tried it. What was your real first impressions, really, of, of giving Q School a go and, and playing on the Challenge Tour? What did you make of it? Uh, the Q school. When I, I first thought about it, I thought, "Well, it's it's going to be tough," but I didn't realise how tough it was. Um, it was sort of you know coming up against seventeen, eighteen year olds um, hitting ten, eleven darters for fun, um, and you start thinking, "Am I actually good at this game?" Um, when you see these kids, but um, then you, you just got to persevere with them, and experience always tells through. To be fair. Um, from when you got a youngster to when you've got an experienced player that have done it before, uh, but yeah, it was quite it was quite frightening at first. To be fair, yeah, that was the, the word I was going to use. Persevere of it because we saw two years later that you're you're winning events on on the Challenge Tour in 2019. Uh, more of the BDO circuit you've been playing on as well. When did the idea to try and pursue a spot in the the BDO World Championship come about? Um, it was after after the year of Q School that year. Um, I turned around and basically said. Um, I've won the Challenge Tour title and, and, and I try, thought, well, go for Q School. Um, if I don't get a tour card, then I'll try the BDO and see if I can get to um, a BDO World Championships. Um, and lucky, luckily enough for me, I, I was playing well at the time, so um, it just gave me that edge to, to go forward with the BDO and, um, and, and try and do it through that way, and uh, luckily enough I did. And obviously there's probably been a, a few differences in in what memories you have of between 2002 playing the World Masters and then coming back onto the, the BDO circuit? What were the main differences that you found playing it more often uh, last year? Um, Standard-wise, um, the standard has gone so high. I mean, I know people say that the, the, obviously the PDC is the, the higher standard, um, but there are so many new players coming onto the BDO at the moment that are capable of hitting the, the you know the Michael Van Gogh and averages of like 104, 105. Um, you know, also staying in the in the averages of sort of 94, 95 um, all throughout the tournaments. And uh, for example, I'd never heard of Wayne Warren before and Nick Kenny, etc. While I was a youngster, um, but now you go and play the BDO, you know of those people and you know to be wary of them because they are they are brilliant players. Um, obviously, Wayne winning the world title this year. I think is he 56, 57 years old. Um, a great player and a great guy. Um, and you never used to see those back in the day. Absolutely, and we, we saw towards the end of, of last year, you were on on the pro tour, beating Gary Anderson. And I remember you saying about it was quite short notice you getting the, the call up to to play in those events. But how did you find that experience going up against the, the top pros in a in a PDC tournament like that? Oh, it's brilliant. It really is good. Um, I got off the plane. I was going to actually um, the play a video event um, in um, in Ireland, and uh, I got the call as soon as I got off the plane, saying, uh, "Can you get to?" Uh, I think it was Dublin. I was in Belfast and said, can you get to Dublin for 11 o'clock? I said, it's, it, I can do, but it's going to be pushing it tight. Um, and I got there at 10 to 11. Um, and um, I ended up being on the Pro Tour. And it was it was an experience, real good, uh, to be in a room with all those players, including Michael Bengo and Gary Anderson, Peter Wright, etc. Um, it was like a dream come true of thinking, I, I want this full time. Um, so it gives me that added I did belief that I want to get a tour card playing with those guys week in, week out. And we come on to this year, 2020, start of the year, you made your World Championship debut at the O2 in, in the BDO and as a seed as well, making the, the quarterfinals on your debut. How did you reflect on your first appearance in a World Championship? Um, it was, I mean, the first game against Nick Fulwell was, was nerve-wracking. Um, obviously, thinking about it too much of, you know, being on the TV and, um, having people watch, you know, millions of people watching the um, watching the TVs and the Eurosport, and obviously off the stage as well. Um, but it was it was great. After I 
won that first game, I'd, I'd actually got belief that I'm thinking, you know, I, I can actually do this. Um, you know, to, to be able to come back from uh, the brink of defeat against Nick um, with the uh, 107, which uh, I, I will remember for these uh, for the foreseeable future. Um, but yeah, it's it's a great experience, and to come through two games, especially against Richard Veenstrom, the who was the world number three at the time, it's brilliant for me. Great achievement. Yeah, it was good to see him. Q School, though, didn't go according to the plan for you after that, but we've seen you play a combination of the, the Challenge Tour as well as the, the WDF, the, the BDO circuit. What, what Was that the plan for you for, you for all of this year before the virus struck? Um, yeah, it was to, to carry on um, doing the Challenge Tour and the BDO, WDF uh, side of it. Um, obviously, with the tour card holders out of the rankings at the minute, it, I think it's put me up to number six, I think. So if they're still doing the, the Grand Slam spots, then at the moment I'm in a Grand Slam spot. Um, so I've just got to try and keep up that that level of um, of play that I'm playing and uh, and see if I can win a few uh, video tournaments and also challenge tour tournaments as well. It's probably hard to say at the moment with what's going on, but in terms of goals, you mentioned there potentially the, the, the Grand Slam, but going forward, is the main goal for you to get back to Q School next year and, and get that tour card? Yeah. Absolutely, absolutely. That's why I'm not um, I'm not just with the isolations going on and stuff like this with this um, this horrible virus that's going around. Um, it's it's hard, but I'm not just sitting around doing nothing. Um, I'm constantly practicing, um, making sure that I've got my A game ready for Q school next year. Yeah. Let's get on to this week then. You were selected in Modus's Icon to Darts the, the first week playing against other players from home. How keen were you to get involved then in, in playing other top players during the lockdown? Absolutely. Um, as soon as I got asked to, to, to play, it was a straight yes. Um, sort of, what do I need? Do I need to do it? Etc. Um, and we had everything set up within a couple of days um, at my house. We got um, webcams, laptops, etc. Um, all laying around uh, where my board is and uh, and it, it's, it's really good um, to be able to get back to a competitive sport again. And you've done really well, uh, winning two of the, the groups during the week and you ended up finishing top of the, the overall table. But how did you find playing the games from, from your own boards at home? Was it weird at first to get used to? Yeah, it was. Um, it was weird not having an opponent in front of you um, or behind you and just playing on your board as if you were you know, practising at home. But you can um, you can see what they're, they're throwing at, you can hear them. Um, and you know they're there, um, so it, it's slight off, slight pressure off because you've got no one in front of you or behind you, but you can still know that they're there and you know that they are um, trying their best to beat you. So you've got to do the same. And, and lastly, I, I know this is something that the Modus are planning to do for a, a few more weeks at least. I know they've got a, a finals that they're looking to do, but are you, are you hopeful of being included in some of the other tournaments? And who else can we expect to see picked to, to play? And who, if you had a choice, would you like to have a game with? Um, I mean, I'm hoping that they do kind of myself. Um, and obviously, um, you know, um, Raymond has been a great addition this week. Um, hopefully he does carry on. Um, and if, if I'd like to see anybody in, um, I'd like to see Phil have a go, uh, to be fair, Phil Taylor. Um, whether he, whether he would do or not is a different matter. He's probably a very busy man doing other things, but, um, It'd be nice. It'd be nice to play Phil. I don't think I've, I've not played Phil since I was eleven years old. So um, it would be nice to have a, yeah, another crack at him. Definitely. Well, fingers crossed for that, and well done again on how well you've played this week. And wish you all the best for for the rest of the year and when it, everything gets back up and running. Thank you very much, Alex. Cheers. Thanks again to Dave for his time. I will finish up with a co-host question, one that I've come up with for, for this week's show, and it is: What is the favourite darts match that you've seen live in person? Yeah, and there's there's a few good options, uh, but I I think I have to go for one because it is one it involves one of the most famous moments in darting history. I think you can rightfully say, at least among uh, darting obsessionist uh, darting history, and that was on the European Tour in 2018 when Michael Van Guren played Ryan Joyce and ended the curse of Ross Smith hitting the first nine darter in five years, zero months, and one day, five, zero, one, on the European tour. And that was the first nine darter I ever saw live in person. I saw um, on the pro tour the following year, Ricky Evans, though his first ever competitive nine darter 
on a European Tour qualifier, but I'd never seen a nine darter in person before. I heard Steve Hine yell out when he threw one, but I was on the other end of the um, building for Pro Tour. So I, I've been, I've heard a nine darter hit before, but that was the first time I ever saw one live in person. And it just so happened to be one of the most famous ones. And I guess it wasn't the greatest match beyond that. Ryan Joyce did have a couple opportunities in early legs, um, couldn't take his chances, and then Van Gerwen just hit that and pulled away. I think he won at 6-1. But just for the sheer um, brilliance of that moment, I'm going that match. For me personally, I've got a, a few written down here, and I was at the UK Open for the weekend when we saw Rob Cross make his uh, debut as a Riley's qualifier, and um, Barry Lynn as well getting to the quarterfinals. So those were a couple of games that, that spring to mind. A couple others... One more recently, I was when I was at the BDO World Championship, the semi-final between Makuru Suzuki and, and Bo Greaves, which went to a deciding set. That was one more recently that I do remember well. In terms of the World Championship, I only really go there as a as a punter, really go there as a fan. So I don't sit there and watch all the games. I'm usually there with my mates and we're going around the venue, doing other stuff, getting something to eat, getting a drink, and enjoying the, the fan zone, the fan village. But one game I do remember... And uh, I know this is a game that Dan Dawson will, will watch at least once a week between John Henderson and, and Andrew Gilden, which went all the way to a, a sudden death leg. It's one of them games where I think we watched the walk-ons, watched the first set, went out for a bit, came back in for a little bit, and uh, it just seemed to go on and on and on. And as I say, it went to a, a sudden death leg and some uh, some great finishing as well. I just had to look up some of the, the finishes in the game. Andrew Gilden with a free ton plus checkout, so 1-2-1, a 101. And a one four three, so it, there was some some good darts in the game. But the one that I'm going to go as my favourite is going to have to be the World Match Play 2018, the first ever game at the World Match Play that went to a, a tiebreaker, and that was a, a sudden death leg, and that was uh, Kim Hybricks just getting the better of Henderson again, thirteen twelve. Some good uh, tips there. I wish I had been there uh, for well, all of those. But anything else for this week? Just to say a, a massive thank you to our uh, guests that we had on this week, Barry Hearn, Chris Mason, Dave Evans. Really appreciate all three of those taking their time to have a chat with us. And um, yeah, we're going to be back with some more Dynamite Darts content, as, uh, as we always do. Our Darts Legend series, we've got Bob Anderson coming up next on that, a few more in the pipeline as well. And as I mentioned earlier, uh, Matthew Ken, the darting nerd, he's bringing a, a series to us as well. Really appreciate that. The Riley's Lockdown series, he's going up against players that have qualified as Riley's qualifiers for the UK Open and having some chats with them. So that's going to be coming soon and our Darts Legend series carrying on soon. So thanks everyone for listening. I hope you're all staying safe and uh, I'll leave you to let everyone uh, make sure they, they hang tight. <laughs> yes, um, and just echo that. Thank you, um, Alex, for this great Legend series and thanks for uh, Matthew, as always, for everything he contributes. And the Lockdown series should be... Uh, um, fantastic. If anyone has any other ideas, please let us know. Um, there's plenty of time to make plenty of content when and there's not that much content available anyway. So uh, if you have any ideas, let us know. Um, other than that, if you ever should hang tight, now is a good time to hang tight because it's the safest thing to do. So it's not just me hanging tight, it's everyone. Hopefully, hopefully fairly soon we can stop hanging tight, we can start letting loose, but until then, hang tight and hang tight.